Welcome to two weeks of shows of the David Frost Show in Hollywood. During the next two weeks, we're going to be welcoming Glenn Campbell, Roy Rogers, Groucho Marx, Peter Fonda, Trini Lopez, Nancy Sinatra, Dennis Hopper, Lucille Ball, Dinah Shaw, Lorne Green, Henry Fonda, Nancy Wilson, Lawrence Welk, Ali McGraw, Carol Burnett, George Burns, Walter Matthau, and Jack Lemmon. And today we begin in the best possible way. Okay, Billy? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's great to be back here in Hollywood again. We were here for Richard and Elizabeth a few weeks ago, and we begin these two weeks. I was just saying some of the people we're looking forward to welcoming during these two weeks, but I said we begin in the best possible way, and we do. You saw I brought on a violin case there. That can only mean one man. And who better to welcome for the next 90 minutes than the greatest 39-year-old in the world? Will you welcome Mr. Jack Benny? <laughs> Why don't you sit here, Jack? How's that? Okay. Is that comfortable? Yeah, an hour and a half we have to sit here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I have a vocabulary that will last an hour and a half. <laughs> you know? It's so good to see you again. The last, Thank you. The last time was in London at the British That's Academy right. of But Wars. you know, wait a minute. Before you say anything, I'm glad that you did one thing when you introduced me. Well, let me say in other words, I'm glad that you didn't do one thing. Because wherever I appear on any of the other talk shows, the minute I walk on, the host always stands up and imitates my walk. Because <laughs> <laughs> they think I walk effeminately, you know? <laughs> well, I can't help it. Did you develop the walk deliberately? Or did it just happen to you? <laughs> Deliberately to be effeminate? No, no, that's the way I've always walked all my life. I can't help the way I walk. But I, um, but, and but, I'm glad, but anyway, doing an imitation of me wouldn't fit on this show. In the first place, you're from England. I don't walk like that in England. <laughs> you see? Now ask me why I don't walk like that in England. Jack, I've always wondered, uh, yeah. why don't you walk like that in England? This is such a lousy, corny answer. I'm not even going to answer it. <laughs> there isn't anybody in the audience couldn't answer that. Somebody answer that. Why wouldn't I walk like this in England? I want to show you how simple and corny it is. <laughs> any, any suggestions? You well, know, what's your suggestion? Just see for the fog. <laughs> what you, you couldn't see for the fog, uh, the ladies. Hey, that's good. <laughs> that is very good. I wish, it's better than my answer. My, my answer was going to be that the reason I don't walk like this in England, because in England I walk on the left side of the street, <laughs> which isn't nearly as good as yours. Would you like my seat for an hour and a half? <laughs> but Bob Hope's always... Uh, um, talking about your walk and mocking you for your walk. walks exactly like I do. And he always talks about my walking effeminately. He walks just like I do, except he cups his hands. Bob walks you know how I swing my arm. Bob does the same thing except he cups his hands. <laughs> But otherwise, he's... Hope always looks to me 
like he's a head waiter bringing somebody to a good table. <laughs> yeah. Well, so much for that. Last time hey, I... this is intimate and nice. Isn't you know, it nice? I like isn't this and love the audience is right close. Isn't it great? Yes, they can isn't... get right at you. <laughs> <laughs> Tear your clothes off, that's what they're uh -huh. doing. They'll tear your clothes off later. Last time I saw you was, you were direct from, you'd had a smashing week in Dublin. You'd been playing the, the Gaiety Theatre in Dublin. Just a few weeks ago. Right, just That's that right. was when we met. Did you enjoy that? I enjoyed it very, very much. I had one of the most memorable weeks. You know, if I were to say to somebody, what were the five or six greatest weeks you have ever had in your entire career in show business? I would have have to mention Dublin because the audiences were marvelous, the people were wonderful, we did terrific business, you know, and, uh, uh, and when I left, and it was only there 11 days, you know, three days of rehearsal and a week in the show, it was almost a crying scene. You never saw anything like it. Everybody mm -hmm. was so lovely. And the nicest, the most exciting thing, one of the most exciting things that happened was when I got back to my hotel, the Gresham, you know the Gresham Hotel in Dublin, there was a message that President Eamon D. Valera invited Mary and I to come to, uh, to his, or Mary me rather, <laughs> Mary and, and Mary. Us. Mar no, Mary and me. The both of God us. God knows, I don't want to make a mistake like that in front of you. <laughs> or William Buckley. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, if I, can, if I can digress for just a moment, then I'll yes, get back. You, then I'll get you back. You go anywhere you like. I saw the show. <laughs> I can go any place I like. Well, it's very nice having seen you. <laughs> no, I'll tell you something. I saw the show you did with William Buckley. Oh, yes, I did his show. Yeah. And I watch his show and I watch your show. And both of you have such beautiful vocabularies that there were a few minutes at a time that I didn't know what the hell you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember. But I knew I was going to watch it, so I had an interpreter with me. I have him sitting with me, you know. But anyway. <laughs> we were in the I, no, I forgot what I was We were in the Gresham Hotel, weren't we? I think we were in the Gresham Hotel and a messenger oh, arrived. Oh, yes, a messenger, <laughs> that messenger uh, said, a message was there <laughs> saying that President uh, Eamon D. Valera, a wonderful man, wanted me and Mary to come and visit him, and we did. So we went to this beautiful mansion, this beautiful home, and I was actually thrilled. And as we walked in, he was standing behind a desk, and he has this beautiful face, this lovely personality, and he was standing there with a smile on his face. He's got He's like Arthur Rubenstein. You know how marvelous he stands and walks. Arthur Rubenstein is about 83 years old. Well, President De Valera is about 86. And he doesn't see too well now, and you would never know it, you see. So Mary and I were talking to him, and he was smiling, and I thought maybe after 15 minutes it might have been a little bit too long. And we were going to leave, and he wouldn't let us leave. He was so lovely. Finally, his phone rang, and this is the funniest thing, Mary and I screamed. <laughs> this is the funniest thing coming from the president of Ireland. His phone rang, he picked it up, said a few words, and then put the phone back in the cradle, but he couldn't quite find the cradle. So I helped him. I took the phone and put it on the cradle, and he said, thank you. And then he says, you know, Mr. Benny, sometimes he called me Jack, and I was thrilled, you know. But he says, you know, Mr. Benny, he said, I don't see too well, as you noticed. But he said, 
fortunately, I get along very well in my quarters. Although, once, about every four days, I fall over a chair. <laughs> Now, the thing that made me scream, here's the president who, who, who timed it. He didn't say, once in a while, I fall over a chair. But he pinned it down to once every four days, I fall over a chair. That means about eight times a month, he falls over a chair. Well, I want to tell you, we couldn't stop. Isn't that wonderful? That is, that is about as good humor that wasn't meant actually to be a joke, you know, and I couldn't get over it. I couldn't get over it. I'm glad you mentioned about London and it's about It's great having you. Once every, about every ten minutes, we have to take a break. So we'll take one now and we'll be right back with the one All and right. only Jack Benny. Welcome back with the one and only Mr. Jack Benny. Jack, what? I love the way they say one and only. I've never heard of another Jack Benny. <laughs> one and only. I'm the one. I must be the only Jack Benny. Yeah. There Which might like... be some people, other people. Do you like the one? Maybe in Alaska or someplace. I don't know. <laughs> you, you haven't run into them very much. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> well, assuming for a moment then that you are the one and the only uh, Jack yeah. Benny, how is it that you've been at the top all these years, and people who've been at the top for a year or two have written their autobiography, and yet search everywhere, and you can't find anywhere you've never written yours. Now, why is that? You mean a, a biography? Mm -hmm. an, aut yeah, an autobiography? Yeah, you've never written your autobiography. My Life by Jack Well, Benny. now, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even say anything funny. <laughs> You timed it. No, 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 I'll tell you. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. And nobody, this is the first time I've ever told this any place. Nobody knows this except my very immediate friends and, of course, my wife, Mary. About three years ago, so many people and publishers have asked me to write an autobiography that I thought I'd write one. And there was a fine writer who was going to help me, and he was going to write it, you see, and I was going to give him all the dope on it, you see. Then I thought, no, if you're going to write an autobiography, you must write it yourself. I hate a book that says, my life as told to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always so silly. It means that you didn't write it. Right. So I decided <laughs> I was going to write this autobiography. I spent two solid years on it. I finished it last year. And you'll never read it, because I'm never going to let it go out. You see? Really? No, no. Now, let me tell you exactly what happened. You know, it's tough for me to write an autobiography, because I haven't got that much time. You know, I'm doing nine million things. But I did take the time, and I made notes first for about six months. Then I wrote my autobiography, and I decided I would not read it after each chapter. I decided I would wait till the book was finished. And I did. And I read it, and I didn't like it. <laughs> it didn't sound like me. I'll explain later why, as long as you want to ask this question, because I should explain why. So then I thought maybe... It's because I know myself too well that I don't like it. Maybe I'm too close to me. So I let my manager, who has been my manager for years, a fellow named Irving Fine, whom you know every, very well, a wonderful fellow, very smart, and I let him read it. As I want you to read the book, tell me exactly what you think. He read it, <clears throat> and he said to me, Jack, I have to agree with you, it is not good. <laughs> so then I thought 
maybe the two of us are wrong. <laughs> You know, he's too close to me. Right. <laughs> so I let <coughs> my director, <laughs> Freddie de Cordova, whom you know also, who has directed most of my television shows, and Freddie spares me nothing. <coughs> he read the book, and I said, Freddie, what do you think of it? And he just looked at me and went... <laughs> <laughs> So I said, are you sure? You know, you're not, you're not too close to me, you know. He said, no, Jack, it isn't good. So then I thought, maybe the three of us are wrong. Yeah. So I let my writer, Hilliard Marks, whom you've met, been with me for years, my head writer, he read it. He didn't like it, and I said, well, Hilliard, maybe you're too close to me. So he stepped back a little. <laughs> and he told me, Jack, it is not you. It isn't funny enough. There's not only funny, it isn't written well. So you I let my sister read it, Florence, in Chicago. I have one sister who is not that show-wise. And she wanted to be nice to me, and she wanted to be sweet. And she said, well, Jack, it's all right, but, you see. Then I decided to let my severest critic read huh. it. And you know who that is. Mary. Mary Livingston, my yes. wife. And not only is she my severest critic, but she actually knows David she knows more about show business than I do when it comes to knowing what is good, why it's good, why it isn't, the reason it isn't. She knows all of these things. So I said, now, Dow, I always call her Dow. <laughs> she calls me Dow. <laughs> so finally... So I said, Mary, I want you to read this very, very carefully, and just don't read a little bit of it, read quite a bit of it. And Mary, who is a lovely girl, and who doesn't say terrible things, and who doesn't swear, and doesn't say anything, she said to me, well, Dal, I said, what did you do? Did you read it? She said, yes, Dal. I said, what do you think of it? She says, it stinks. <laughs> now, for Mary to use a word like it stinks is like a four-letter word coming out of Leo DeRocia. <laughs> That's what it's like. So when Mary didn't like it, I even let my closest friend read it, George Burns. And George was very nice about it. George says, Jack, there are a lot of good things in it, but for you to wait all these years to write a book, it's ridiculous unless you write something great, you see. And I, incidentally, if I may digress again. Yes. Do you know how George always introduces me to his friends? He's been doing this for 20 years. He has yet to introduce me as Jack Benny. How do you think he introduced me? No, I like if I were to meet you for the first time and George introduced me to you, he'd say, David, I want you to meet Mary Livingston's husband. <laughs> George doesn't think anybody knows me. <laughs> you know, that's what he does all the time. But George read it and he said, Jack, either you should write a joke book with a funny gags or you should write a better book than that. So I merely threw it away. I tore it up, and I wouldn't let it go out. Now, may I explain to you... Are we taking too much time? No, no. May I explain to you what's difficult about a fellow to write an autobiography? Yes, because I was wondering why it didn't work. I would rather have a biography by someone, a great writer who knows me, who likes me. And there have been some, uh, <laughs> you know, there... I remember once uh, Robert Sherwood, the playwright, he knew more about me than I did. He could have written a book about William Saroyan, 
Maybe you wouldn't understand it, but he could write a book about me, you see. Let me tell you what's difficult, David, about writing an autobiography. The nice, wonderful things that have happened in my life that I would like to pe people to know about, I can't say those things about myself. You see? It sounds like you're bragging, it sounds like you're egotistical, and I want the people to know the wonderful things, the real great things that have happened. I can't say it. If you were writing a book about me, you can say those things. What, what? You see, so I, and I can't. And another thing, I'll tell you another reason it's tough for me to write an autobiography. Mine would not be a Horatio Alger story. You know, people write, love to read books where a man was so poor that when he was a kid, he sold newspapers barefoot in the snow. Well, I was never barefoot in the snow. In fact, I was going to call my book, I Always Had Shoes, <laughs> which was a great title. You know, because this never happened to me. My father and mother, my father wasn't rich. But I didn't have to sell newspapers out in the cold. He could afford to get pay for violin lessons. He could afford to send me to school to do, to do anything. So there's no great story that starts out where I'm in terrific difficulty. You see? Now I'll tell you something else. I have never had many setbacks. Everything that's ever happened to me, I've been in show business over 55 years. There's never been a setback. There's never, it's always been a slow rise where I was in vaudeville, right. cheap vaudeville, big time vaudeville, a headliner, movies, radio, then a star in radio, then television, and it all went like this. There was never a time when anybody ever threw me out of a job. I never had. <laughs> you see, and what makes me glad I'm as old as I am, it's too late to throw me out anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? There are people... <laughs> Where are people going to throw me out? Now, you take Frank Sinatra, right. who has had an exciting life. He's been way, way up. Then he had problems. Then he went way, way up. Today, he's the king. The king of show business is Frank Sinatra. You know, one of the kings. Frank, Bob Hope, you know, a couple. But you, you've got to have troubles. A great book by Joey Lewis, who was cut up by gangsters. No gangster ever cut me up. <laughs> you know, nothing happened to me. I have n really not had that kind of an exciting life. The only thing I've had is a great life, a happy life. I've had, if I have to say it myself, a successful life and a business that I love. So what is there to read? I've been married to the same woman for almost 44 years. <laughs> you know? There's been a woman, Mary, whom I love more now than I did when we were first married. We're being married, we're married 43 and a half years. Well, nobody wants to read that. <laughs> they want to read where I had eight divorces. I think it's well, I'm not going to get a lot of divorces just so I can write a book. <laughs> you know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Isn't it? Sounds like the most refreshing book ever written. Actually. No, unfortunately, it isn't. Yet, yet, somebody else could write. Yeah. You know who I'd love to have write a book? A biography because she's a marvelous woman. I'm not going to mention her name right now, but she knows me as well as anybody does, and once she followed me on a concert tour and wrote the most beautiful article about my concerts. Funny, clever, very witty, and 
she wrote it so beautifully and she knows so much about me that sometime, maybe I better do it pretty soon, but sometime <laughs> I'm going to say to her, write a biography. I'll give you all the dope and I just leave it to her. You see? And this will come off sometime because I feel pretty healthy, you know. I'm, I'm going to have her write a book and she'll write a great one. Now, you see? How can we guess who it is? Huh? Who is it? It's not your daughter. No. Because I read. All of my daughter could write a good one. She wrote a lovely article. Yes, my daughter could write a good one. But this woman, I think, could write a great one. Someday I'm going to ask her when she's not too busy. She's very busy right now. What's she busy with at the moment? <laughs> well, I'll tell you who she is. I don't mind. <laughs> because I may never ask her. She may never want Her name is Shana Alexander. Oh, yes, the editor of McCoy's. You know Shana Alexander? She used to be with Life magazine, and now she's with... Editor uh, of McCall's. Yes, yeah. editor of McCall's. And honest, the things that she writes, and the things that she says, and the clever way that she does them, you know, and really knows me, really knows all about me, because she's followed my career as, as as long as anybody could, you know. You said that someone would have to put in all the wonderful things about you that you couldn't yeah. say yourself. What are the wonderful things you couldn't well, say? Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I'm just telling... <laughs> Now, just imagine. <laughs> I am just telling this man that the reason I won't put it in the book, because I'm embarrassed to write those nice things, and he wants me to tell it now to millions of people. I can't. <laughs> when we're alone, I'll tell you. <laughs> when we're alone, I'll tell you. Well, we've got to take a break. I'll meet each one of you later and tell you. <laughs> we'll be right back with Jack Benny. <laughs> Welcome back with the one and only Jack Benny. I've said it again. The what do you see? You know, I want to say something. This is one of the cheapest shows I've ever been on. <laughs> you sit here for an hour and a half and they bring you water. <laughs> you would think a drink. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like? You got to get some Jello or whatever you like. I didn't need Jello when I worked for it. <laughs> Jello. <laughs> you were the first person, actually, you know, weren't you, to bring humour into commercials and things and integrate the humour and the message, the medium and the message. That that was one of your. Bring in the Jello. In the well, yes, in the commercials. <laughs> well. Even before that, we were the first ones to do satire on, on uh, television. And the first sponsor was Canada Dry Ginger Ale on radio. You know how I got on radio? I was on an Ed Sullivan show. Ed Sullivan asked me to come on his show. He did a sports show. And I said, well, what do we do? He said, oh, you and I write something. And I went on Ed Sullivan's show, and the Canada Dry Ginger Ale people heard me, and that put me in radio. And this that is famous, after... That famous first line that's always... Your great first line on radio when you announced yourself, didn't you? And said, good evening, this is Jack Benny. Oh, I said, this is Jack Benny. There'll be a long pause while you say who cares or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Right. But anyway, now I don't think... I think eventually I would have been in radio because I was, had already been a star on Broadway in shows, you see. And I left a show. I had 20 more weeks to go. And I was getting, at that time, which is years ago, about $1,500 a week. Now, David, years ago, that was an awful lot of money. I, I worked for Earl Carroll, and I asked him to let me go. And he said, why? I said, because I keep hearing names like Gene and Glenn, Sam and Henry. Gene and Glenn with no, actually no background, and the whole United States knew them from radio. I said, I must get into radio. 
So I came back to New York, and I asked my wife, this is where Mary is always so right, I said, should I give up? And I wasn't saving much money, you know, contrary to my being a stingy character. <laughs> Believe me, Mary and I both spent a fortune. So I didn't have much money. And I said to Mary, I said, Doll, what should I do? Should I give up this show at $1,500 a week? Because it was going on the road and going to radio. She says, if you think you want to go into radio, you give up that show at $1,500 a week. And I gave it up. Now, I was in vaudeville, of course, during that time, but vaudeville was dying. So finally, Ed Sullivan said to me, Jack, come on my show, you know? And the next day, I had the call for Canada Dry Ginger Ale, and I must, whether I'd been in radio later or not, I must thank Ed Sullivan for asking me to be on that show. Right. You know, he's helped an awful lot of people. Do you know that he's helped that great violinist, Itzhak Perlman? You know the violinist that has polio? Every time I see Perlman, he says, always thank Ed Sullivan for me, for bringing me. He brought him from Israel here, you know. Oh, he's brought... Incidentally, I'm giving three concerts in Israel in October with Zubin Mehta. He's going to conduct the Israel Symphony Orchestra, and I'm going with him. I join him in Paris with Arthur Rubenstein, and we're going to Israel. Rubenstein gives his three concerts, and I give mine all with Zubin Maid. I'm quite excited about that. It's a pretty know? impressive trio, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think it's great. But that's not what we were talking about. What were we talking about? <laughs> that's what, what we were talking about. Kind of dry else. ginger ale. We were just... Moving. No, but something else you You're asked. getting into radio. No. Integrating commercial. Oh, yes. Now, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> you see, Ed Wynn was the first one that actually did comedy commercials, but he only did it in this way. When his announcer would say, well, because he was with Texaco then, you know, Texaco gasoline is so and so and so, and Wynn would say, is that so? And things like that, but never did satire. So finally, we decided we would satirize commercials, and they were very funny. But the sponsor wasn't sure that he was going to like it. Finally, we did one where the sponsor nearly threw me off the air. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what it was. It was the funniest commercial. I didn't pan Canada Dry Ginger Ale. I just didn't say whether it was good or not. See? <laughs> here's, here's a commercial we get. Now, I want to leave it to the audience. This isn't a funny commercial. I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we have a salesman for Canada Dry Ginger Ale whose territory is the Sahara Desert. <laughs> and one day, he was walking along with cases with with Canada Dry Ginger Ale, and he ran into a caravan, a lot of people who were dying of thirst. <laughs> so he, he gave each one a glass of Canada Dry Ginger Ale, and not one of them said it was a bad drink. <laughs>
Welcome back with Jack Penny. Well, the, that commercial went great here in the studio. Did Canada Dry love it? It went great with the people, except Canada Dry Ginger Ale was afraid. They said he didn't say one thing. I said, well, I didn't say it was bad. <laughs> they said, no, they didn't like it. Now, what happened? So they wanted us to cut out all comedy commercials. So we begged them. The agency even begged them. Let it go another few weeks and see what happens. And fortunately, within the next few weeks, Canada Dry Ginger Ale people got all kinds of letters saying how wonderful it is to be able to listen to funny commercials. So then they just let us go on, you know, and that was, uh, and that was it. Now, Fred Allen wrote very funny commercials. You know, he used to write. Right. And, of course, he was a great writer, as you know. And uh, what was the origin? George Burns had funny commercials too, you know. What was the origin of your feud with Fred Allen? How it started, yeah. you mean? Well, let me tell you something, David. Anything that lasts, that's good, never starts with an idea. Like, for instance, let me put it this way. If I said to Fred Allen, Fred, or he said to me, let's have a feud, that wouldn't have lasted four weeks. We would have overdone it. The feud actually started because Fred and I were good friends. I always listened to his show, and he listened to my radio show. Now, one day, he had a 10-year-old boy who played the violin. And when the boy got through, all Fred said... Jack Benny ought to be ashamed of himself. <laughs> <laughs> so I answered him some kind of a joke where I said to Mary, who was playing the part of my secretary then, supposedly, I said, Mary, take a, a note to Fred Allen. This is on my program, which he's listening to. And I had some kind of a joke, which I do not recall at the moment, that meant that I could play when I was 10 years old as well as the boy, but it was done in joke form. Do you know what Fred did the next week? He brought people from my hometown, Waukegan, Illinois, on his show to prove that I couldn't play the violin. <laughs> so the next week, I brought people from Waukegan to prove I could play the violin. This feud went on and on and on for years and years and years until this great, great comedian passed away. In fact, we were in the feud for eight months before we even discussed it with each other. You know? Really? Oh, yes. That's right. That's how. Now, that's why it was successful, you see? Because we didn't make it up. We didn't say, let's have a feud. Because that wouldn't... Uh, but Fred was an amazing guy. He used to say the, he used to say the most awful things about me. <laughs> he was faster than I was. <laughs> you know, he used to say the most wonderful things about me. And some of the jokes that he would tell, like George Burns, who tells outlandish things about me, even though they're tr true. <laughs> he embellishes them yeah. in such a way you see, when I tell what George Burns does to me, I tell it truthfully. He keeps adding and adding and adding till it's impossible almost to believe, but they're true. And, and uh, 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 Fred Allen, he would do jokes about me like this. For instance, when I first became successful, or after I'd been successful quite a while, and I had this feud with Alan. This is before they built the school in my name in Waukegan, Illinois, the Jack Benny Junior High School. Yeah. So they didn't have it then years ago, but they did plant a tree in my honor <laughs> in the courtyard of the courthouse in Waukegan. And in a very short time, the tree died. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody could figure out why it died. And on Fred Allen's show one day, Fred said, you know, with that nasal twang, the way he talked, Fred says, 
How do you expect a tree to live in Waukegan with the sap out in Hollywood? <laughs> in 43 years this I'm telling you the truth that big a fight we've never had but let me tell you silly things that happen when you're first married I was married about two years and Mary was with me I was playing the Orpheum Theater in San Francisco that's years ago when I was big time and she was working with me then I put her in the show you know see you know when I just found Mary she was selling hosiery in the May company Right, and didn't want to go into show business yeah. at all. No, and I took her out and married her, and you know, once you take something out of the May Company, you can't bring it back. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> anyway, the first little fight, first fight we had. Now, we Mary lived in Los Angeles. I was playing in San Francisco, and Mary always liked for me to wear very conservative clothes, which I like, black, blue, or brown, dark, and conservative ties. Now, one day I was leaving the hotel to go to the theater, and I had a very flashy striped tie. Now, we're only married two years. She said, where'd you get that tie? I said, I bought it. She said, well, take it off and put on another one. I said, I'm not going to take it off. I'm only going to the theater. And I'll see you at the theater later. I left the theater. She never came to the theater, and she was working with me. I went back to the hotel. There was a note left. She went back home to her mother and father because I wouldn't change my necktie. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> this is true. Now, once at the Palace, New York, we were working together. And I was talking to a girl on the phone that I used to go with. She called me to congratulate me and say hello. And Mary got mad at me because I talked to her for a while. I said, but Mary, I used to go with her. We almost got married. She got so mad that she hit me <laughs> with a cold cream jar. And I had to walk on the stage. And there was like blood. And I walked on the stage like this. And Freddie de Cordova said to me, he said, I guess that's where you got that habit of working right there. <laughs> this, is, this is what happened. You know? We'll be right back with Mr. Jack Bennett.
Welcome back with Mr. Jack Benny. Jack, it's such a great joy having you here, isn't it? Isn't it? Just... Really. And you, and you mentioned uh, concerts just now. Yeah. We'd, we'd love to see a little of your mastery of this great instrument. I love that concert of yours I saw in... Uh, I saw in London at the Royal Albert Hall. That's the only time I've seen your concert. It's marvellous. Will you take out the old violin for us? Which one is this? Have I have got... two in here. There are two. Yeah. Would you take one out for us? Huh? I'll tell you. I'll tell you why he wanted me to do this, which he didn't mention. Well, I was going to... He what? saw my concert with the London Philharmonic Orchestra at Albert Hall. And when, after the concert, he said to me, you know, Jack, I know you're not a good violinist. <laughs> and you're not supposed to be, but I don't know too much about music. You fool an awful lot of people. <laughs> because I heard them applauding, you know, hollering bravo. And I don't know enough about it, he said to me. So how do you fool the people when you give a concert? So I said to him, well, sometime when I come on a, your show, I'll do something also that I've never done before, and I'll show you the tricks that I use. Now, when I say fooling an audience, believe me, I cannot fool fine musicians. And I cannot fool the music critics. They know how I play. But the music critics accept what I do because they know it's satire. They know that I think I'm the world's greatest violinist. <laughs> and they go along and the music critics love it. They give me the greatest reviews that you've ever read because they know that I love the violin. They know I don't make fun of it. And they know I try to play as well as I can. It's, a, it's kind of pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, anyway, now here's what I, here's the only way I can fool people who come to concerts who are not, who don't know too much about music. You know, I can't fool, uh, you know, I can't fool Isaac Stern. I can fool Henny Youngman. <laughs> You know, like when you play cadenzas, fast cadenzas. Now, what would Henny Youngman know about that? Very he good. thinks cadenza is a Spanish house. You know what he doesn't know. <laughs> now, here is my Stradivarius, which is a beautiful instrument that's worth, I would say, about thirty, forty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $35,000. Now, I want you to hear something very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. I have a violin here called a percenda. Now, you ask 10 people on the street what a percenda is, nobody will know. But you ask them what a Stradivarius is, everybody will know. They don't even know what a Guanarius is, which is as good or better than a Strad. But they know Strad is a word like jello. <laughs> <laughs> they know jello is a gelatin dessert. They know Stradivarius is a violin. And Yasha Heifetz told me something very, very interesting, and also my dealer, that in about 80 or 100 years from now, there will be no more strads. They will be broken. They will be, he called it, deoxidized. You know, they can get too old. They'll be stolen. There'll be no more. And this violin, the Presenda, will be one of the few that will take its place, because this violin is 80 years younger, you see? So in 80 or 90 years, 80 you're going to have to give up right. that one. I mean, you won't, with this one. you won't live to see it. I will. <laughs> you know, <'cause laughs> the way I take my time. <laughs> now, I'll try and show you what I do to fool an audience that doesn't know too much. 
about music who come to see me. I'll use a mute because I don't want to keep everybody awake. Because we I have no accompaniment. Now, when I give a concert, which you saw, the one you saw in Albert Hall, I usually open with a number called Sigourney Bison or Gypsy Airs. And I'll tell you why I open with that. Because it starts on the G string. <laughs> the soldiers love it. But even a mediocre violinist can... Well, I'm not going to... But however... On a G string, a violinist, even if you're a lousy violinist, you can play better on the G string than the other string. You see, it's easier. So I make it a point to open with... You see, I make it a point to open with Sugoi device, which starts, even if you scratch, it doesn't make any start. Now that sounds not too bad, Very right? Good. All right. Now, <laughs> right after that is a cadenza, which is difficult. Now, if I play the cadenza, if you play it fast enough, a lot of people won't notice the mistakes. <laughs> because after I do this, I'll show you the cadenza. If I play for. Next is now you see if you play it that fast, who knows how many notes I miss. <laughs> now if you play it slowly, then you could notice. It. But if you play it fast, you go. You wouldn't notice that. Like that. You see what I mean? So that's how you fool it. Now, if I play, because I do the whole, I do about an hour and 15 minutes and I give a concert, see? Now, sometimes I play the Mendelssohn, the first movement of the Mendelssohn Concerto. Now, this is tough to start because you're on your own. You're open, you see? And the orchestra merely plays a measure and a half of... And you've got to go right away. And you're right out in the open. So here's how I fool them. <laughs> I say to the conductor, no matter where I play, whether it's Carnegie Hall, I say, look, we'll play Mendelssohn now. I say, vamp till ready. <laughs> now, that's pretty silly, isn't it? For Mendelssohn, Bam till ready. He said, what do you mean? Well, I have this friend. So I say, instead of just going, go. Then by this time, the audience is laughing. And when they get to laugh loud enough, then I go. <laughs> now, I'll show you. Wait, I'll show you what I mean. Let me, let me show you what I mean right with this audience. I can do it right with this audience. When I tell you to laugh a little bit, laugh a little bit, then louder, and then when I tell you to really yell, I'll show you how easy it is to fool an audience. Now I say, bam, till ready, so we start. Laugh a little bit. <laughs> louder. <laughs> Real loud. Welcome back with Jack Benny. What what else do you do with the violin to fool us? Huh? What else do you do to fool us? Well, I play I play numbers that the great violinists play, but I can't play it as well as they do. That's the only difference. I play I play a version 
I'll play a condensed version of the Beethoven concerto, the Vinyaski concerto. I play uh, Rondo Capriccioso, which, which is a famous violin solo. Now, let me tell you how I fool them. This is the violin solo you've heard it a million times that goes... <laughs> Well, the way I fool them there is I do imitations of great violinists. You see, so they're laughing. So while they're laughing, I'm going. And my last imitation, I wish we had time to do it. I do, I do, for, I do Isaac Stern, I do Heifetz, I do. Uh, Miss Elman is a great violinist called uh, Joseph Zagetti, who the concert goes. And I, for the finish, I do an imitation of Arnold Palmer, the golfer, <laughs> if he also played the violin. <laughs> and that's a real, that's a great imitation. How do you mean? I don't know if we got time to do it. Yes, sure. so well, have we? Yes. Well, here's the way. After I do the imitations, each violinist. <laughs> You see, I'll leave the mute on. It's better without the orchestra. Well, anyway, now the last imitation is Arnold Palmer, if he played the violin. And I'll do this for you. I do this. Now, you hold this and take out the other bow, too. Hold both bows. There it is at the bottom. That's right. And don't touch the hair on the bow. Right. Yes. <laughs> Like this, right. and hold the violin. Hold both bows in one hand, the violin, like a caddy. And this is if Arnold Palmer were a violinist playing this same number. So here's what I do. He has just hit a ball <laughs> that's gone, let's say, to here. So he walks up to the ball. at the ball again, he does this, takes his fiddle, and it takes a ball, one of the balls.
Welcome back with Jack Benny and Arnold Palmer. Jack, what, what... George Burns will think I'm stealing his stuff with his cigar. <laughs> what do you he think? He smokes the cheapest, worst cigars. No, not cheap, but they're not good. No, not good. No. Rubbish, are they, really? What's the biggest laugh do you think you've ever got in your career? The line that's quoted most, I suppose, is the your money or your yeah. life line. Is that the... Your favorite? Well, one? that is quoted as the biggest laugh. And then no make, it makes no difference. It's been quoted in every magazine, you know, and all over the world almost. In fact, Gene Kern, once a playwright, wrote a whole article about it. But and there have been laughs bigger than that, but they weren't cleverer is cleverer right yes am i talking right <laughs> i'm so worried in front of him you know? <laughs> this englishman he drives me nuts <laughs> no but they, it it was uh, 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 maybe some of these people do not know the original joke the original joke that it was written up for years and years and years is i was supposed to be leaving don wilson's home and as I leave his home late at night, a hold-up man comes up and says, Hey, fella, your money or your life? And there's a long, long pause, <laughs> which got a big laugh. He says, Come on, I said, your money or your life? And I said, I'm thinking it over. <laughs> this is one of the biggest laughs and was widely written, you know, and explained. But there have been other laughs uh mary got the biggest laugh that w we ever received by just three words by just telling me because of a terrific situation which i think is too long to go into a terrific situation where i start to talk and mary merely says oh shut up now that doesn't sound funny unless you know the situation that's the longest laugh really we have ever received you see now the biggest laugh, one of the big laughs, comparable to the ones we're talking about, was in my dressing room once. I, Rochester is supposed to be in my dressing room. This was a television show. And a messenger boy brings in a telegram for me. And Rochester takes it and he says, Rochester says, wait a minute, boy. And he puts his hand in my trousers pocket, which is, is laying over the uh, trunk. And he says, there I know I'm right, laying, not lying. Right, excellent. excellent. I'm, I wish, I'm glad this hour and a half is over. <laughs> anyway, he took a quarter out of my pocket and tipped the boy. Now I come in with a rope, you see. And I'm standing behind the trunk, and he says, Mr. Benny, where I said, there's a wire for you, and I read it. Now I started to put on my pants, and I did this. <laughs> I said, Rochester, who took a quarter out of my... <laughs> That's one of the biggest things in the world. I've been looking forward to this ever since we arranged it, but I couldn't have believed I would enjoy it as much as I have. I can't say thank you. Well, enough. I certainly enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Mr. Jack Benny. Yeah. promotional considerations furnished by National Airlines. Now National Airlines flies non-stop every day between Miami and London with the only in-flight movies. National says you're going to have a great flight.
And Chevrolet, featuring the new Capri sedan that provides what other cars only promise. Get on the move with the luxury one of the Chevrolet 70s, Caprice. While in California, the staff of the David Frost Show are staying at the world-famous Ambassador Hotel, completely renewed from the spacious rooms to the exciting now Coconut Grove. Stay in the center of Los Angeles at the Ambassador. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.